Good morning, Bodhida. We'll just allow a few minutes now for everyone to join before we get started. Barada, we'll just wait another minute or so. Just as we're waiting to get started then, um, just make sure you can, can you hear us? If not, raise your hand or, or uh, put something in the chat perhaps. Um, all the microphones are muted apart from the people presenting and we will be using the chat function for any questions. So feel free to put your questions in throughout the presentations and we'll be addressing those um, towards the end. And just to confirm, we will be sharing the slides, uh, the recording and, and the questions after the webinar. So we'll just give it a few more seconds. And I think we're good to get started. So good morning, Borida. Kriso Kanesyan in webinar Borida. A very warm welcome. A very warm welcome in most parts of the country uh, to our webinar this morning. So I'm Pauline Bella. I'm the delivery manager for the technical support team here at RAP Company. And thank you for joining us as we're talking through our guidance on low carbon and resource efficient construction procurement. Next slide, please. So just a quick note of the agenda this morning. Um, we'll be hearing a short intro from me about RAP Company. I'll be passing over to Dr. Andy Rees, who will be talking about the Welsh Government priorities on resource efficiency. And then we'll be hearing from Dan Whitaker from Unomia about the construction guidance. You'll then hear briefly from my colleague Thomas Funk at RAP Cymru uh, about the support offer we offer organisations. And then we'll be pausing for some questions and answers. So please do feel free to put those into the chat as we move through the presentations. Dear Thomas. So we are RAP, the Wastes and Resource Action Programme. So even if you're not familiar with RAP, it's likely that you're familiar with um, some of our work. RAP works with governments, businesses and communities to deliver practical solutions to improve resource efficiency around the world. Our vision is a world in which resources are used sustainably. Our mission is to speed up the move to a resource efficient economy. And we can do this by reinventing how we design, produce and sell products rethinking our use and consumption of products and redefining what's possible through reuse and recycling. Thanks, Thomas. So RAP is an evidence-based organization. We deliver our work using four levers of change. Policy and technical support. We have a team of analysts, technical experts and economists who provide research, modeling, advice and services for businesses and governments to develop and implement waste prevention and recycling policies. We have business voluntary agreements. These are collaborative change programs designed, developed, convened and managed by RAP, whereby businesses agree to and work towards common goals to prevent waste and carbon emissions. These include the UK Plastics Pact. This has now been replicated across a number of countries globally. We have Textiles 2030 and the Courtauld Commitment, which works around food waste. Our financial mechanisms, grants, loans and investments to develop capacity to overcome specific market failures and our citizen behaviour change. We research, design, test, deliver and evaluate behaviour change campaigns to help citizens prevent waste and recycle more. In Wales, particularly, you'll be aware of this around our work with local authorities to increase and improve household recycling processes and rates, which has now put Wales on the global map, ranked as number three in the world for recycling. 
and RAP use these levers of change to deliver our work to reduce the impacts of food, clothing and plastics consumption and production on our work on resource management, which underpins these focus areas. Thanks, Thomas. All of our work is driven and underpinned by policy and here in Wales, RAP Cymru supports the Welsh Government to achieve their policy goals. I won't go into too much detail on this as we'll be hearing next from Dr Andy Rees from Welsh Government, who's best placed to dive into this in more detail. Thank you. The aim of our work is both the, to drive both the supply and demand of recycled and low carbon and sustainable materials and increase reuse in Wales. We do this by delivering four areas of work. Our collaborative change programme, where we provide strategic and technical support to local authorities to meet recycling targets, helping them increase recycling rates and find markets for those materials. We have market development, supporting Welsh manufacturers to consider design for recyclability and increased recycle content in products produced at commercial scale. Complementing that, we've had the Circular Economy Fund, which although now closed, was a £6.5 million grant fund that RAP administered on behalf of Welsh Government and was available to, for to manufacturers looking to introduce recycled content into their products. And finally, our public, public procurement support, engaging with Welsh public sector bodies and sector um, to advocate and support the adoption of public procurement policies and practice that prioritise products which are made from remanufactured, refurbished and recycled materials or come from low carbon and sustainable materials. Thanks. And it was this sustainable public procurement project, there's far too many P's in that line, isn't there? Funded through Welsh Government that has developed this low carbon and resource efficient construction procurement guidance. Our support for the public sector aims to make the procurement of reused and remanufactured goods and products containing recycled content the new normal. To do this, we need to change behaviours and really change culture starting at the top down. Thank you, Thomas. So why construction? The built environment has an important role to play in supporting Wales to become a zero waste net zero carbon and one planet resource use nation by 2050. Reducing embodied carbon impacts arising from the construction cycle, including raw material sourcing, manufacture, use and disposal of construction products will be a critical element in reducing Wales's overall carbon impact. Procurement across the built environment life cycle through design, construction, renovation, demolition or facilities management can enable a reduction in these impacts through implementation of sustainable procurement hierarchy principles. This guide helps public and private, sec private sector clients and contractors consider the whole life carbon impacts linked to the purchase, design and construction of their built assets. This enhances the application of circular economy outcomes, enhances high quality reuse, recycling and avoidance of waste to landfill and clearly defines relevant procurement requirements and sets out expectations for supply chain responses. As you know, the Welsh public sector spends about eight billion pounds a year on the procurement of goods and services with construction and maintenance representing a significant amount of that spend. This guidance, or really a tool, is designed to help the public sector embed sustainability into their procurement of pr construction projects. This will also help them reach their own sustainability goals and meet their statutory commitments. It does this through about 50 pages of model procurement wording that organisations can use and shape to ensure that sustainability is included within their procurement of built assets. The guidance was conceived and developed as a way to help the Welsh public sector continue their contributions to the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act, Beyond Recycling, Wales Procurement Policy Statement and the commitment to net zero public sector by 2030 with net zero Wales by 2050. It was also designed to help procurers begin thinking about whole life carbon, whole life carbon approach, which is something that a lot of procurement teams I think are finding quite a tough nut to crack. The guidance in particular will help with the selection of materials with lower embodied carbon and enhancing the longevity of the built asset by helping consider the design for durability, flexibility, disassembly and deconstruction, as well as considerations around reuse, repair, refurbishment and recovery. 
And finally, the guidance strongly adheres to the sustainable procurement hierarchy. Thank you. So just before we take a closer look at the guidance, I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Andy Rees, who is the head of waste strategy in the resource efficiency and circular economy division of Welsh government. So over to you, Andy. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Burda, good morning, uh, everyone, on uh, this beautiful day, although a rather hot one. Um, I'm going to give you a quick whistle stop tour through the strategic and policy context, context that have informed uh, the guide uh, that we uh, are hearing about today. So ne uh, next, please. Uh, just to remind you um, that the whole of the public sector in Wales um, has to uh, meet the legal obligations under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the seven goals. Um, of course, all seven goals are equal, but just to highlight the A Prosperous Wales one um, that includes references to a low carbon society that uses resources efficiently and acts on climate change, as well as, uh, of course, making Wales uh, and its people more prosperous. We have left the European Union, but we still have a number of international commitments, uh, not least the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I just highlight uh, their goal 12, responsible consumption and production, and goal 13, climate action. But of course, all the other goals are important as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the programme for government um, for the, this, the, the, this term uh, of government has 10 wellbeing objectives. That's a, a strategy duty for us to produce those. And just highlighting four of particular relevance um, in relation to an economy based on the principles of fair work, sustainability, industries and services of the future, building a stronger, greener economy. And then uh, at the bottom there, embed our response to the climate and nature emergency in everything that we do. Next, please. Um, just a little bit of uh, sort of background uh, information on life cycle assessment and how uh, carbon uh, dioxide um, and other greenhouse gas emissions derive from the whole life cycle of a product. From the top left there, from when uh, materials are mined or quarried or extracted uh, in terms of oil, that uses a lot of energy, uh, plant uh, using diesel, etc. Uh, transporting it to a factory uh, also involves carbon dioxide emissions. Most factories use a, a lot of energy. Um, either directly or indirectly, uh, and release carbon uh, dioxide emissions. Uh, the product is used, which of course in itself uh, does generate carbon dioxide sometimes. Um, and then if it's disposed of as waste and it goes to uh, combustion and it contains plastic, um, that is releasing fossil fuel carbon dioxide. If it consists of biodegradable waste uh, and goes to landfill, then that's generating methane that is 30 to 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as the greenhouse gas. What we want, of course, is a lot more uh, recycling. So uh, next, please. That should highlight that. Yep. Uh, next. And um, recycling uh, reduces CO2 emissions um, principally uh, well, in, in, in two ways. It avoids all of the uh, emissions above upstream, but also many manufacturing processes using recycled content uh, need less energy and less heat uh, to melt or process the, the material. Next, please. So as I said, recycling uh, removes all those uh, upstream or most of those upstream emissions, next please, and removes most of the downstream emissions. Just on the left there, uh, for those of you aware of what scopes one, two, and three are, um, that uh, shows you where, where, where they feature within that life cycle assessment. Of course, not producing waste at all in the first place and keeping things in productive use also reduces uh, even more carbon emissions. Next slide, please. Um, Hopefully you're all aware of what embedded carbon is, but basically um, that is the sort of inventory of all of the carbon emissions associated with um, extracting and constructing uh, using the raw materials that go into that product or material. So that is the embedded carbon or carbon footprint uh, that it is known as as well. Next please. And um, this is some analysis done by uh, Leeds University under their CMAP project and the Green Alliance that focuses on the five key sectors uh, where resource efficiency can generate the biggest savings in carbon emissions. So next please, hopefully that highlights construction there. Yep, at the bottom um, has, has by far the biggest uh, potential uh, carbon savings through resource efficiency. Construction, of course, is the sector that uses the, by far the largest amount of uh, raw materials and components, et cetera. Uh, it also generates the largest amount of waste. Next please. 
Um, we, we talked traditionally about the, the normal waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle, but under a circular economy now, uh, we're focusing on far more R's. Um, I think I've got 11 there. There are at least 12, probably more. Um, so right at the top, uh, refusing, you know, don't actually, uh, don't actually buy something in the first place if you've already got something uh, in a cupboard or down the road that you can use. Renting, leasing, hiring, reducing, using less. And then really importantly, um, and I had to be a bit creative with this R, uh, in terms of keeping things in productive use for as long as possible. So I've used the words resilient, uh, reliance and resilience. So designing something so it can be maintained, serviced and, and last as long as possible. Um, things like reuse, repurpose, refurbish, repair, et cetera, are really what we want to see in the future. And recycling is deliberately at the bottom there. That is the least desirable good thing to do. Next slide, please. Um, just to flag up, uh, in May this year, uh, Natural Resources Wales published the results of the 2019 uh, Construction and Demolition Waste Arising Survey. I haven't got time to go into the detail, but I, as I remember, it was about 3.4 million tonnes of uh, construction and demolition waste were produced, of which civil engineering, general building, and then construction of domestic buildings, and then construction of highways, etc., were the largest. On the right there shows a pretty good recycling rate uh, for most of them, I think 84, 78% for highways, up to 95% for civil engineering. That's great, but those few percentages of a large tonnage are still a lot of uh, waste that goes to landfill or incineration. And we need to tackle that further. Next slide, please. So um, we have our new uh, net zero plan uh, for carbon budget two period with the statutory 100% reduction target by 2050, and then that intermediary target of 63% reduction by 2030, over what remains of this decade. Next, please. Um, the Net Zero Plan has various sector chapters, and just highlighting, highlighting very quickly uh, the public sector chapter, and hopefully next there should be a highlight. Next, please. Oh, okay, uh, right, we'll, we'll, don't worry about that. Um, in, in, in the public sector chapter uh, is a big section on sustainable procurement. Um, on the previous slide, uh, that was an analysis of the carbon footprint of the uh, NHS or health sector in Wales. And the procurement of uh, goods and products was by far the largest component of the uh, carbon footprint of the sector. Um, the various actions within the sector chapter um, I'm just highlighting one there, but we will expect the products we buy and use to be fully recyclable, multi-use, or able to be repurposed as part of a more circular approach to waste. Um, and we also reduce the level of goods and services we consume, removing waste wherever possible. That is particularly relevant to construction, uh, as I highlighted uh, a few minutes ago. Next, please. So we have our uh, Beyond Recycling Circular Economy Strategy published last year. Uh, with the uh, over, uh, objectives of one planet resource use, zero waste by 2050, uh, essentially 100% recycling. And our vision of a circular economy is where we keep resources in productive use for as long as possible and avoid waste. Next slide, please. This shows uh, diagrammatically um, those uh, aspirations. On the left is kind of where we are now um, with uh, very thick circles showing three planets worth of resource use and the materials circulating around quite quickly within the economy. Lots of raw materials used, too much waste to landfill and energy recovery. On the right is where we want to get to in the future, deliberately thinner arrows and a much bigger circle uh, where we use less materials within the economy um, and they flow around a lot more slowly. So using fewer raw materials at the top there and as far as possible, no waste to landfill or energy recovery by 2050. Next, please. Hopefully, I don't need to explain um, why one planet resource use is kind of important, but I'll just uh, mention a few things. Um, over half of our global carbon emissions relate to the products we've purchased. So that's embedded scope three carbon emissions. So that's why we want to reduce that embedded carbon through using fewer materials and making them last longer. And then really importantly, not forgetting the nature crisis, 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress comes from resource extraction and processing. Uh, we only have one planet, um, not only is it only fair that we use our fair share, uh, but it sustains us with the oxygen, water, food, and some of the pharmaceutical products we need to survive. So it's in humanity's long-term interest not to trash that planet. Next slide, please. 
Within Beyond Recycling, we have six key themes. Uh, I do not have time to go through them in detail, and I'll just uh, feature uh, one or two of them in a minute. Next slide, please. We also have uh, eight core actions and about 40, 45 sub actions. And just highlighting the one on the left there about procuring on the basis uh, within the public sector, which prioritizes goods and products made from remanufactured, refurbished, and recycled materials, all come from low carbon and sustainable materials such as wood. Next slide, please. Um, just to uh, relate to some other work uh, that the Welsh Government has done. Um, through the Ministerial Construction Forum and the subgroups uh, working with the construction sector. Um, and they have come up with this really great route map to net zero carbon buildings in Wales. Um, and that covers the scopes one, two, and three emissions, including the uh, embedded carbon in the products and materials used in construction. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also keen to support the foundational economy um, and uh, through the Social Value Act and, uh, and, and forthcoming uh, regulations that I'd like to cover construction, um, in ensuring proper social value through uh, the construction procurement, and that should include ethical and responsible sourcing as well. Just highlighting examples on the right there, um, there's a social enterprise called Greenstream Flooring in Pontypridd um, that uh, collects, uh, diverts some um, uh, carpet tiles from the skip, they're uh, high quality, high, highly durable, and can easily be reused. Um, Paint360 and Community Repaint um, are organizations that, um, uh, that uh, take waste, uh, waste paint that would otherwise go to landfill and re-engineer it and reuse it. And the Welsh Government has used um, some of that paint on the inside and outside of a number of its buildings. Next slide, please. Um, just to also highlight, um, buildings not only have the fabric uh, and uh, the bits and bobs that go inside, but also uh, they have to be fitted out uh, with equipment. So let's not forget the embodied carbon within all of the office furniture. Um, so there is a new uh, public sector procurement national framework agreement for furniture solutions that prior prioritizes reused and remanufactured furniture. Um, I am actually sat on that chair uh, top right there that I paid for as my own money um, is a remanufactured G64 orange box task chair. Uh, other suppliers uh, are, are of course uh, available. It cost me two fifths of the price of a brand new chair and you would never know that it isn't brand new. Next slide please. Um, this is uh, the purpose of uh, today's uh, session so I'll just uh, skip on. Uh, that's also part of uh, you know what we're trying to do is uh, get our organisations to provide guidance. Importantly we're also working on new uh, non-domestic premises recycling regulations that will require um, all of those waste streams to be separated out and collected separately for recycling and not subsequently mixed. So in relation to construction, uh, that'll be particularly cardboard, uh, it needs to be separated out and go in one stream. Metal and plastic waste, um, particularly on plastic containers uh, and metal containers. Glass waste, uh, textile and small waste uh, electric and electronic equipment. Uh, we are working on the regulations and the code of practice as we speak and we anticipate the regulations coming into force next year. And that will apply to the construction sector um, as a non, uh, the construction sites as non-domestic premises, i.e. somebody isn't living in them. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, just to uh, reiterate that we've done quite well uh, in the past. This shows where our local authorities uh, have been in terms of recycling levels. Um, so I think the bottom left is about 2013, 14. Um, the darker the green, the higher the recycling rate for each local authority across the UK, and the darker the yellow, orange, and then red, the lower the recycling rate. So uh, top left a few years later, uh, top right another year or two, and then bottom right is where we are now. So you can see uh, that our Welsh local authorities and, well, um, and the people of Wales uh, have been doing fantastically well in their uh, houses, um, but we now uh, need also other sectors, industry, business, and the public sector, but also raise their game, not only in terms of recycling, but also in terms of all of those 11 R's uh, above the 12 R's above recycling that I highlighted earlier. So uh, thank you for listening, and I hope that gives you an insight uh, about the importance of this guide to try and meet uh, all of those strategic policies and aims. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That's uh, 
quite an insight there, quite a lot to lot to take in. If anyone's got any questions for Andy, do put them in the chat, I'm afraid. Um, we're really grateful for Andy's time this morning, he, but he's having to dash off to another meeting, but we'll make sure we get any questions over to him if they do come in. Thank so, you. thank you very much. We'll now pass on to, um, to Dan Whitaker. Um, Dan is a senior consultant with Unomia, and he's going to introduce the low carbon and resource efficient construction guidance. So over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Pauline. Um, hello, everybody, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for, for dialing in this morning. Um, that's been, uh, uh, it's, it's really helpful for you to come in and, and listen to, uh, to what we've got to say. Um, as Pauline said, I'm Dan Whitaker from Unomi. I was involved in the development of the, of the guide, uh, the Low Carbon and Resource Efficient Construction Procurement Guide. Um, and over the next sort of 20 minutes, so I'll give you an introduction to the guide. Uh, where you can download it from, what you can expect to find in terms of content and how it was originally designed to be used. Slides to move on. Go. Right. Um, so it can be downloaded from RAP's website at the link that you can see in the middle of the slide there. And also find it by typing low carbon and resource efficient construction procurement into your preferred search engine and it should turn up towards the top of the, to the return in terms of the search. It's available in both Welsh and English. And if you download it, you'll see that this is what the front cover looks like down in the bottom right hand side. So the um, the guide was originally developed to advise public and private sector um, construction clients on how to prepare embodied carbon and uh, resource efficient uh, procurement requirements. It um, also has additional guidance that's associated with um, contractors and on how they should be passing on those project commitments down their supply chain. Uh, it's applicable to building projects and civil engineering projects. Um, and overall, the guide lays out um, the low carbon principles that have been, uh, been discussed so far um, and allows the user to select those that are most appropriate to their particular construction project. So the guide provides um, various points of guidance. Um, it provides some low carbon, low embodied carbon criterion targets um, and how those can be included in procurement documents and its contracts. As we've discussed, whole life carbon assessment is going to be important moving forwards. And the guide provides an instruction to whole life carbon assessments and how the whole life carbon assessment process can be used to help evaluate embodied carbon impacts. It also um, has been mentioned, it supports um, the process of, um, of uh, tendering and uh, includes supplier questions that uh, that can be used to uh, to to ask for responses on low carb low embodied carbon and resource efficient construction and also provide some guidance on on good practice responses and how those can be evaluated overall it provides details of how to monitor and evaluate uh, performance against those requirements that have been set, and also how to go about securing data that will help you understand the overall impact of your, uh, your construction project and evaluate that impact. Let's move on to the next slide. There we go. Um, so we've discussed sustainable procurement hierarchy already and it may be as as has been mentioned previously be for, slightly familiar to you in terms of its origins of, of matching or looking um, similar to the waste hierarchy and this is a, an evolution to the waste hierarchy really with the most preferred options towards the top and the least preferred towards the bottom in terms of the reduction uh, activities it's, it's in relation to trying to retain the existing assets that you've got and thinking about whether opportunities to repair what you already have rather than procuring new thinking about designing out waste and uh, uh, addressing material resource efficiency issues by designing out waste in the first place and moving towards more lean resource efficient construction when those options have been considered it's next thinking about whether or not to buy used or refurbished or remanufactured uh, products. We recently, as you know, we are moving to um, a, 
picked to a new office in, in London as part of that, we had to refit the office and we made a conscious effort to uh, to buy, uh, to work with our contractor to identify sources of, of previously used products for that internal fit out. And we managed to, to uh, yeah, achieve a, a very high level of reuse for things like internal partition walls for the meeting rooms, uh, doors, various other internal fit outs and uh, in terms of the office furniture, desks, et cetera, and chairs all came from previously used sources. Um, once you've moved through considering those sort of aspects, it's about thinking about whether you can procure products that have, can have extended lives through uh, potentially leasing or service contracts. So in these circumstances where you're leasing products rather than rather than uh, buying outright and owning. Uh, so the classic example in that circumstance is, is uh, flooring and carpet tiles. They, um, uh, there's for a long time been various uh, manufacturers in the marketplace that uh, lease lease carpet and carpet tiles and flooring, uh, which means that ultimately they take ownership of that of that product. They'll come and re replace and repair it as and when it's required. And ultimately at the end of its life, they'll come and remove that that uh, flooring and recycle it back into the, into uh, new carpet tiles or new flooring back at their facilities. And so it's moving towards those sorts of models or considering them. Uh, it's about uh, buying more sustainable products. So uh, thinking about design for deconstruction and design for dis design for disassembly and considering low carbon uh, alternatives, moving towards greater timber use or increasing the levels of recycled content. And as Andy mentioned, the, the very bottom end of the end of the pyramid, the inverted pyramid is dealing with those wastes that we have been on, we have been unable to uh, avoid generating. And it's looking at how best we can divert those from landfill and move them away from energy from waste. So, for example, again, a classic example is plasterboard offcuts from the construction process and looking at um, entering take back uh, contracts with the manufacturers. So they take away those offcuts and again, reprocess them back into, into, uh, into new plasterboard. As has been previously mentioned, whole life carbon assessments got a really important role to play in. Um, in uh, addressing uh, embodied carbon uh, aspects. And the guide provides both an introduction to whole life carbon assessment, but also links to various other uh, more detailed guides and uh, professional statements, for example, a RICS professional statement for whole life carbon assessment, which basically sets out the methodology that should be followed by uh, design and construction teams in terms of delivering uh, a whole life carbon assessment on projects. It's worth just uh, quickly looking at the, the diagram at the bottom of this slide uh, that shows the whole building life cycle um, and how whole life carbon assessment uh, relates to that. Um, so from when the building's being constructed through its operational phase, end of life when it comes to potential demolition or strip out, and then beyond that, what happens to those materials that have come out of that demolition or strip out process. The, um, the guidance, follows this process and includes this process, but there's certain aspects, these ones, operational energy and water use that are included in the guide, because this guide obviously is focusing on the material aspects, but it does include all the other steps within the process. So in terms of when you get into the body of the guide, the first main section that you come across is the key definitions, targets and KPI section. Um, it has some key definitions in it in terms of the key terms uh, that will be used throughout the rest of the guide. So it provides some explanation on the scope of those terms and what they actually mean. Um, there has certainly in the past been some confusion by some in terms of the difference between recycling and recycled content, for example, and it, it clearly states what is meant by each of these different terms. It also provides advice on how to approach whole life carbon assessment requirements where the there isn't uh, benchmarking data available and where benchmarking data is limited. 
But where there is good benchmarking data, it provides example targets and KPIs that you can set in, in three different brackets, standard, good, and, and best practice. And it can be things like recycled content or construction and demolition waste volumes to be generated per 100 meters squared of building, how much should be died, what percentage should be diverted from landfill, et cetera. So those targets look like this when you enter the document. Um, so over on the left hand side, it has the, the various uh, target brackets, standard, good, best practice. And then on over on the right hand side and towards the middle, it then provides details of the considerations and constraints that may uh, impact on your decision as to which target level you, you pursue and set. And then over on the far right, it's got details of uh, what potential credits may be picked up against the various certification schemes like BRIAM if you were to choose those particular target levels. In terms of the bulk of the guide, it's, um, as has been previously mentioned, contains a lot of detail on client actions that can be undertaken within throughout the, over the construction life cycle in terms of particularly the procurement actions. Uh, and then it also includes uh, procurement guidance itself and model wording and clauses and questions that you can pose to your supply chain and, and uh, model responses that you might expect to, in return for, the, for when you're doing those tendering exercises. So the guide follows the uh, the REBA stages and is at the very uh, towards the the middle of the guide and at the beginning of this section that has got the model wording in it. It has this particular uh, navigation page, and you can use this navigation page to access both the uh, the client related actions and procurement guides or the contractor actions and, and clauses. So your supply chain can also use this guide to to pass on those those. Uh, uh, requirements that you've set down the supply chain. So if you click on any of these areas where it says click here, it will take you into that particular section of the guide. It's not designed to be read in a linear fashion. It's designed to, to dip into it and go into those sections that are relevant to you based on your REBA stage at that, at that time. So if you were to click on one of these, what you would typically see is a page like this, and this is generally the structure that you'll see throughout the, the, the guidance. Over on the right-hand side, it, sorry, over on the left hand side, you've got details of what the objectives are at that particular uh, REBA stage in terms of your objectives that you're trying to achieve and what you want to get out of that particular REBA stage in terms of uh, driving low embodied carbon and resource efficiency into your construction procurement exercise. And then over on the right hand side, it's got model wording that you can uh, use and shape for your, for your own, uh, your own uh, particular project. Down at the bottom, You've got uh, the jumps navigation page, which takes you back to that previous page that I just showed you. And then also arrows that take you a page forwards and a page back. And also the horizontal three lines will take you back to the overall uh, contents page for the whole guide. So these are the, the down in this bottom right hand corner is, is one of the ways that you can navigate through the guide itself. So when you um, come to look at the text within the guide, there are a certain approaches that we've taken. So where there's inverted commas around a particular section of text, that's a piece of text that is, has been designed for you to, to lift and use and shape for your own, your own particular uh, procurement exercise and insert into your, into your documents, et cetera. Where you've got these square brackets, those square brackets represent a point where you can insert your own um, environment, link to uh, or, or reference to your own environmental policies or uh, sustainability policies or other documents that you that are relevant to be referenced at that point in the, in the procurement process. Within the guide as well, you'll find areas um, where the text has got uh, the opportunity to insert targets and this links to that target section that I spoke about a, a couple of minutes ago. So where you selected a standard good or best practice target, when you see text like this, this is the point at which you can insert that particular target into, into, your, into your text. I also mentioned that there's uh, selection questions uh, at various stages uh, throughout the, the uh, REBA process, there's points at which you're obviously engaging with your potential supply chain. And so there's various questions that are set out within the document that, that you can then use to engage with your supply chain and identify that whether or not they, they're a suitable candidate to deliver 
uh, against the aspirations you've got for the project in terms of low embodied carbon and resource efficiency. So it has a series of questions, for example, the top one, what experience, if any, does your company have in terms of delivering whole life carbon assessments? Uh, and it also then provides support in terms of the evaluation of those responses. So the types of evidence you'd expect to see in an ideal response. So below the questions, it then provides what those sort of examples of the sort of things you'd be expecting to see. The guide also uh, provides, obviously, as you move through the REBA stages and the, and the procurement process, you come on to uh, contract management, and contract monitoring, and the guide also provides uh, details of, of the types of outputs uh, and outcomes that you'd be expecting at each of the each of the different uh, stages of the process. So, for example, in terms of uh, contract management from a design team perspective, as you go through the design process, you'd be expecting that uh, a whole life carbon assessment would have been undertaken. Um, and this details the types of evidence that you'd expect to come back in relation to that whole life carbon assessment. And this, again, links to the requirements that are set out in the, in the professional statement, in this case, in relation to Rick's professional statement for the whole life carbon assessments and the reporting requirements that are set out within that methodology. And so this then allows you to, to ensure that you're, you're getting the right information that you want out of that particular aspect of the, uh, of the, the procurement exercise. So overall, um, we're lo obviously looking to drive uh, net zero carbon buildings and with a particular focus on embodied carbon. And there are various case studies that are available in relation to this. Uh, UK Green Business Council in particular has got a number of case studies on its website. And those are case studies that reflect projects that have undertaken whole life carbon assessments. And in particular, as well as focusing on the operational carbon aspect of focused on embodied carbon. And this is just one example of that. So in terms of uh, plot 3A at New Bailey, which is one of the UK Green Business Council case studies, they used whole life carbon assessment uh, as, as a mechanism of understanding their embodied carbon element. And against their baseline that, uh, that they undertook, they identified basically a 25% uh, a reduction in upfront embodied carbon by delivering a, a, introducing a range of measures into that design and construction process. So it was things such as optimizing the structural solution, use increasing the levels of recycled content and secondary materials they were using in aspects such as their steel, their concrete, and in the, the facade and structure materials more widely. They then looked at uh, reducing uh, and avoiding the use of materials in certain circumstances, for example, uh, moving to exposed ceilings in the office areas to reduce the need for that suspended ceiling elements, and also uh, used recycled uh, raised access flooring to help deliver that 25% um, uh, reduction in embodied carbon. So, as I say, there are there are there are buildings and, and construction projects that are already starting to take this forward and introduce these types of measures. So what we hope the guide will do will be to facilitate the, the introduction of these sorts of measures uh, and help you in, in terms of your procurement exercises starting to introduce some requirements. Um, as I said, the guide can be downloaded for, for free from the website. And I believe that we'll also have dropped a, uh, a link into the into the chat as well, so that there's uh, the links available to you to, to click on now and download it if you'd like to. Um, and I think at that point, I'll hand back over to uh, to Thomas, I think. Yep. Great. Thanks, Dan. I think I've got control here. So yeah, if anyone has any questions for Dan, um, please do submit them now through the chat function. Uh, but first, just wanted to let you know, you know, that through our Welsh government funded program, we offer a range of support to public bodies in Wales to help embed sustainable procurement principles into your organization. So we can provide, we have a huge range of 
project support we can provide. We can provide strategic support, looking at existing procurement policies and processes, conducting spend analyses and impact prioritizations, as well as delivering bespoke sustainable procurement training. Um, we can assist your organization in the development of individual procurements from the planning stage through to the measuring and monitoring stage. And we can help address knowledge gaps or barriers that exist in specific categories or through engagement with specific sectors. Um, we have a variety of tools available on our website, including this construction guidance. Um, we also have case studies and other guidance documents, along with previous webinar recordings. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar on, online in due course, as well as sending it around to all the attendees. And you know, through this support, we're really committed to helping the Welsh public sector achieve net zero by 2030. So if you'd like to chat, more with us about our support offering or how RAP can help your organization, please do get in touch. Um, I've included our contact information here. So that's uh, Pauline, myself, and Hugh's emails. Um, feel free to drop us a line anytime. We're always happy to chat about any potential projects or support. Um, so now, you know, I'll go over to Hugh to see, you know, have there been any questions submitted through the chat, Hugh? Yeah, good morning, Bodizel Pub. Um, done i have no questions for you i've been keeping an eye on the chat function um oh and sue has actually asked one question about main question is about metrics are the data we should be asking on all major construction contracts done um of course you know you can answer this now but uh, it might be a good idea for if um, if anyone has any questions and after thinking about this over the next uh, couple of days they could always email questions in but for the moment done could you answer that one please yeah, I think the question was, are there certain metrics in relation to um, to uh, low embodied carbon and material resource efficiency that um, that they should be asking for already? And uh, within the guide, the, it, we set out various metrics around things like recycled content, recycled and reused content, um, waste targets, etc., cetera, um, waste diversion targets, waste generation targets. Um, and yeah, I, there shouldn't be any reason why you shouldn't be asking for those. I think in terms of whole life carbon assessments, there's very little benchmarking data available at the moment, which makes it a, a more difficult to, to set targets from what I've seen. But I think this should be, um, we should be requiring and requesting where whole life carbon assessments are being undertaken, that the data is being gathered in a way that then allows us to create benchmarks and we, then we can benchmark our performance against uh, other buildings in the future as a minimum. Thank you, Dan. So as I mentioned, you know, if people do have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with uh, myself, Pauline uh, or Thomas, and we can pass on the inquiry then. All right. Well, thanks, Hugh. Thanks, Dan. I suppose, you know, that that sort of concludes our webinar. We'd like to thank, you know, Dan and Andy for joining us today. And thanks to everyone for attending. Like you said, any any burning questions afterwards or if you think of anything, don't hesitate to get in touch. And likewise, if you'd like to discuss any of our potential support offering as well, please do get in touch. But hopefully everyone uh, can stay cool today. And thank you very much. We'll leave it there. Diakon Vau.